It's good morning, everybody. How's everybody feeling this morning? Good? Yeah, I know, usually uh, 2015 is the start until Monday, but we thought, you know, Dave's in town, so we thought, hey, let's, uh, let's wake everybody up. Um, get ready for 2015. Um, as you probably, you probably remember, we had Dave in Hong Kong for Start Saturday a couple of years ago uh, when we had it in a church in Quarry Bay. And I don't think he knew it was a church, so his language is very colorful and everybody was very excited. There was a picture of him we have of him in the middle with a, like a, a halo around his head as well. A lot of funny pictures. And uh, uh, but one thing I'd like to remember about that, and it's a little side story for Dave, is um, in, in the audience that day, there was a guy um, who was at Goldman Sachs. What? That's right. That's right. That's right. Some guy was pitching a porno site. I remember that. He was like, that was great. Keep going. I think we got video of that on YouTube. Um, but there was a guy um, that came to the conference uh, who, was, who worked at Goldman Sachs, and he's like a banker guy, and he was looking to change his life. And he came out to listen to Dave. And, uh, but Dave didn't change his life. Um, but somebody else in the audience, some, one of the other speakers I got, which I was very happy, actually it's quite interesting, Marianne's here as well. She helped put on the, um, the uh, Wall Street Journal's uh, tech conference here in, in, in Hong Kong and brought people like um, Jack Dorsey, Al Gore was here, and uh, the founder of Airbnb was here as well. And I went up to him at the break and said, do you mind to come out and speak for 10 minutes? the stars of Hong Kong, and he said, probably not. But there was, a, there was a pretty girl with him that I guess was in the star community that helped get him to the conference that day. And he spoke about Airbnb, and then, if you know the story about Airbnb, it's a very inspirational story, um, how, they, how they built their company from zero to such a big company. And that guy from Goldman Sachs was so excited, he wanted to join them um, and get a job at Airbnb out here in Raising Asia. Um, but I guess what happened, it, was, it didn't work, it didn't turn out for him. But somehow Uber came along. And he became the, the head of Uber for Asia, and that's Sam Gilman right here. So that's pretty amazing that he's here today. So give him a round of applause. Come on, that's a pretty cool story, right? Anyway, so, but anyways, as you know, we have a long, long uh, tradition with Dave McClure. Um, you know, we had a conference here just a couple months ago that was the fifth anniversary of Startups HK. And I always tell the story, and if you weren't here, I'm going to tell it again. This is probably the last time I'm going to tell it. But basically, Dave came down to Hong Kong through Cyberport. So actually, everything was born on a Cyberport. It was an angel conference, and it was before 500 startups had started. And he, was, he came to town to talk about um, you know, angel investing and startups and things like that. And then somebody in the audience asked Dave, hey Dave, when you leave, what should we do? Because you know, there's a momentum that's caused these conferences and these big Silicon Valley type people come here and talk and spur all their magic joy to everybody, but when they leave, it kind of dissipates, right? And he said, you guys should get together at a coffee shop and talk and create your own ecosystem. Your own, your own community, and I guess that's what we did. So, as you know, Gene Su is over here, John Buford is in the house as well. We got together at a coffee shop based off of that recommendation and started Startups HK, which is just a couple of guys. And now we have thousands of members, and we cover the press here, and we're able to get people like Dave, hopefully when he's in town, come and do a talk for everybody. So, um, that's our connection with Dave. So, thanks a lot, Dave, for that inspiration. Of course, he doesn't remember that. <laughs> I don't think he remembers that at all, that part of his life. But we've been following him on Twitter, we've been following him on Facebook, we've seen his, seen his great rise. I don't think he needs much of an attend, uh, uh, introduction, because you're obviously here to hear Dave, so I will shut up. But I'd like everybody to stand up. Stand up right now. This is the beginning of 2015. This is your new startup world. And give a warm, warm welcome to Dave McClure. Thank you very much, everybody, for doing that. Hello. So, cool. um, I also want to say... Hello, hello. Also want to uh, introduce Ray Ma. She's also here from 500. She's based out of Beijing. She's out here. She'll do a little talk about the Chinese startup system after Dave speaks. So, And we also have uh, Nine Gag and Shopline, who are alumni of the 500 Startups program who are from Hong Kong, and we'll bring them up on the stage later to talk about their experiences. So that's what the day's gonna look like. Um, we have a uh, hashtag, so take, take pictures of Dave, or you wanna take a selfie with Dave together, <laughs> hashtag at Dave and HK, and we'll put it up on the site later. Start that off with you and me. Okay. Um, and then if you have any questions, please take your uh, iPhone, your Android phone to pigeonhole at dot at slash 500HK. There is a question and answer thing here. 
which is really cool. I've used it before. You can write a question. <laughs> Um, uh, write your questions and then people can go there and upvote the questions. So if you have a similar question, you don't need to type it out again, it'll go to the top and we'll bring up this board later after Dave talks and then go over some of the questions. Because we want you guys to ask questions because this is your chance to sit down with Dave. Um, and finally, if you didn't put your name card at the front, we're going to draw one name at the end to have lunch with Dave and me and Gene. What's so that's the probably not as exciting. Hashtag, <laughs> hashtag is Dave and HK. Okay, so let's get on with this. Okay, so I'm not going to do any um, fireside chat. I'm not going to talk much at all. But I wanted to guide Dave, Dave through some topics I thought that the Hong Kong startup scene here would like to hear about. Um, so these will be 10 kind of uh, topics, and he'll, go, he'll expand on them as he likes. And if you have questions about it, please, you can raise your hand still, or just throw it on the pigeonhole thing, and we can all take a look at it. I think it would be cool to have a snapshot after this event of the questions that were asked and raised at today's event. Okay, so... First of all, Dave, um, let's talk a little bit about 500 startups and how it looks today. I mean, I mean, it's only been two or three <laughs> days into the new year, but I guess you know from what you've built, all the companies you've, you've gone over 500 startups now. Yep. Um, so what is what does it look like today? As a snapshot. Uh, so we actually just did a uh, summary of 2014 on the website, so I actually have those numbers uh, handy. Um, so we started, I guess unofficially, I started working on. Uh, first incarnation of our first fund, I guess late 2009, early 2010, when I was still at Founders Fund. Uh, we got the first closing of the first fund down at the end of July, I guess. Uh, but I would kind of say we've been you know, investing for about five years now. Uh, the total portfolio, I think, is around 950 companies. I'm not quite sure. I'd have to count the individual groups. And, uh, it changes pretty rapidly. Uh, our first fund was about 29 million and about 260 companies. Our second fund was 324 or 25 companies. That was 44 million. And then we're working on our uh, third fund right now. Uh, and I'm not sure if I can disclose all that info, but we have about 275 companies and we're probably about halfway uh, done raising. We're a little different than most other funds in that we raise as we invest, which is also a little unusual. Uh, and then along the way, we have a few other vehicles uh, for uh, India, uh, Mexico, and Spanish-speaking markets. And then just this past year, um, we opened a fund for Southeast Asia that our new managing partner, Kylie Eng, who is also Malaysian, is running. Uh, and we're probably working on a few other new vehicles for this year, which will be uh, Korea and Thailand-focused and maybe Middle East-focused as well. And we might do something in the... Uh, Greater China region, we'll see how that goes. Um, out of those 900 companies, uh, it's probably you know appropriate to maybe talk about the first 300 or so. Uh, it looks like, based on our portfolio strategy, about of a third of the companies die within the first year or two. Another third survive at some level of modest uh, functionality and revenue of customers. Uh, and usually a third thrive, and in varying levels of detail thrive. Uh, of those third that are thriving or working, I think we'll probably get to some kind of material exit eventually for maybe 15 to 20 percent of those. And it looks like we'll get significant outcomes probably from anywhere from 5 to 10 percent of those. Um, so that's more a numeric assessment of how things look. Uh, of that entire portfolio, um, I think a little under a third are international companies, so probably about 250 companies out of the 900 or so are out, have some presence outside the U.S. or started outside the U.S. Sometimes they're incorporated in the U.S. or later reincorporate or move to the U.S. Uh, we've invested in about probably 50 different countries uh, and a uh, pretty strong concentration in Mexico and Brazil. We kind of started a lot of international efforts there. So probably about 100 companies in Latin America, about maybe 75 to 100 in Asia, if I'm including India and Australia. Uh, and then probably not quite 100 in Europe and the Middle East, maybe about 40 or 50 there. And we've started doing a lot more in the Middle East in just the last two years now, about 17 investments there. Um, about a third of our team is international, uh, was not born in the US, we speak. We're, we're about 45 to 50 people on the team, uh, it's not just me anymore. Uh, about 15 of those are doing investments, and uh, collectively, I think we speak about 20 languages, so we 
really been trying to expand the team, and, and we're in about eight, eight or nine countries now. So still the majority of what we're doing is in Silicon Valley, uh, and a lot of our investments are in Silicon Valley, but a pretty substantial effort to broaden that outside the world. Uh, outside, outside the world, outside, we're investing in Mars. Uh, outside, uh, outside the valley. You know the valley is the world, it's outside the valley, it's outside the world. Um, yeah, so. Uh, more coffee. More coffee, yeah. <laughs> or, or too much coffee for that. Um, I guess what else can I tell you? We, we invest in a broad variety of types of companies. Uh, you know, still the basic thesis is we look for companies that uh, generally have, you know, a transactional model, have a functional you know, sort of product that have early customer usage. Uh, although, you know, there's some companies that, that vary from that. I'm not sure whether, uh, Ray, do you think you have a business model yet? I'm not really sure. Yeah. You're working on it. No, 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 we have profit. You have lots of users. You have profit. Holy <laughs> crap. <laughs> we shouldn't have done that then. Absolutely. <laughs> no. uh, Raise the founder of Nine Gag. I think they have 70 or 80 million users now. Uh, 80, yeah. And a few of them pay you some money, actually. Some of them. They play games. And they play a lot of games. Yeah. And, and so does Ray, I think, also. But yeah. Anyway, we'll get to you later. Hold on. Uh, no, we, uh, we really believe a lot of. Uh, future growth that's happening in the market is going to be outside the U.S. That's obviously true, uh, but still a lot of the startups are, um, you know, a lot of talent comes into the valley or starts in the valley, but I, I don't think that's going to be uh, that uh, as much true going forward as it has been. Okay. Sorry, was that really fucking long-winded? Yeah, that's right. No, that's perfect. Time. Perfect. 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 I'll, I'll cut you off. <laughs> um, okay, so, scenes. yeah, so you tweeted scenes. something up the other day. Um, I thought it was quite interesting. Um, looking at scenes, you do a lot of travel. So if anybody follows Gabe on Instagram, he's in like Egypt, he's in Dubai, he's in Singapore, he's in Taiwan. He spent New Year's in Taipei, and then he came here right afterwards. So, I, so this question of this kind of topic is, you know, the scenes and the ecosystems that you visited. You know, which are the big, biggest ones? Which are the best ones? Which are the ones you think are the ones to follow outside of the valley, of course, and maybe Boulder? Like, what have you seen growing around around the world? Uh, well, I mean, clearly Beijing and China is a huge uh, ecosystem that's continuing to develop and Ray is in Beijing. The expert on, on China, Ray is, but I'm a little concerned about there's a lot of money in China right now. There's a lot of enthusiasm because of Alibaba, because of Tencent, uh, Baidu, etc., WeChat. Just, you know, I kind of feel like it's late 90s uh, US in China right now. So I'm very long-term bullish on China, but I'm short-term a little scared of the valuation environment. And so we're kind of trying to be cautious about that. Um, you know, we're still investing in China, but there is some crazy shit going on in Beijing at the moment. Um, crazy because I, I remember raising 100,000 US dollars from the Silicon Valley Fund. It's not enough to get in play. Well, it's not that. It's more the case that people are raising, you know, a million dollars on PowerPoints in in Beijing right now, at five million dollar valuations and higher, and that's fucking crazy, uh, and not very sustainable. I don't care how big the Chinese market is. Um, so you know, we'll see where that goes in the next 12, 24 months. But uh, certainly, you know, I would say the first or second most competitive place on the planet is probably Beijing, and it might be first. Um, there's just a ton of really talented people in China. There's a lot of people in China. There's a lot of market in China. Uh, there's a ton of innovation. It's not just copying shit from other places. You know, I mean, payments on WeChat and other things are certainly you know innovation that's happening from China, not from other places. Um, outside China, you know, we kind of think about the world probably based on four or five global languages. That's English, Mandarin, Spanish, and Arabic primarily. Um, maybe Hindi, although India is actually a very fragmented language-speaking market that does speak English also sometimes. Um, and um, and then probably another 20 interesting geographies or languages as well that are 100 million person markets or more, or maybe 50 million developed markets, 100 million undeveloped markets or underdeveloped markets. Um, but I think a lot of how we look at allocating capital and where scenes, scenes are happening um, is based on smartphone penetration and uh, Availability of online payments. So those two things, really uh, taken together, maybe combined with GDP, 
uh, are probably the, the two or three things that are really determining market opportunities. So uh, number of internet capable devices, which is probably a you know, pretty much proxy, uh, smartphones are a proxy for that. Uh, ability to pay online, uh, whether that's credit cards or PayPal or Apple Pay or whatever, WeChat. WeChat. Um, and then some level of available GDP to spend, and you might want to look at what's the prevailing cost to live and look at the luxury spend as the component of that. Well, so for some markets, you know, there's very, very, uh, I don't want to say poor, but people with very low incomes who are, you know, occasionally internet accessible. Uh, in India is an example of that, um, other places are as well. Um, you know, for us, there's probably 20 to 50 uh, metros in the world that we are active at the moment. There's probably, you know, eight to 10 where we actually live, and there's another 20 to 50 that we invest. Uh, and I think that could easily be stretched to 100 to 200 without too much trouble. Uh, it's possible it could be stretched to 500. Um, but the limiting factors in a lot of markets um, we'll hear over and over again from the investor community the limiting factor is talent. It's such bullshit. It's completely not true. Uh, there's talent almost everywhere. Any major metro with a million or more people has talent, uh, except possibly in the investment community. The investment community is usually where there's a lack of talent. Uh, so not a lack of capital, but a lack of imagination and talent. Uh, and certainly, I would just be more specific, a lack of familiarity with investing uh, in high-tech startups and investing in high failure rate sort of businesses. So like, I think you know, the basic story about what we do is we invest in a lot of companies, very small checks. We expect most of them to fail and a few of them to succeed, and a few of them to succeed wildly. And so that's um, a difficult investment thesis for a lot of people to get their heads around who start in real estate and finance and who are used to companies that grow 10 to 30% per year with a modest, you know, fail rate. Um, so rather than, you know, people who look at real estate, like aside from real estate crashes, which actually happens sort of frequently, you know, you might think about their business model as let's invest in, you know, things that grow 10 to 30% per year that only fail less than 10 to 20% of the time. Our model is the exact opposite. It's like, let's invest in things that fail 80% of the time, um, but the other 20% grow like 100% per year. Uh, and it's very asymmetric and it's very difficult to sort of get used to that. And so people who start out investing in high tech who put you know one or two checks into the market uh, at a half million dollars or more or something, you know, they see a lot of failure in that. Occasionally they'll see really big wins and they think it's easy, but more often than not, they'll think it doesn't work and then they'll basically stop investing in that area. So I think we have a lot of education to do on the investor side. Um, there's education to do on the entrepreneur side as well, but I really think a lot of investor, a lot of entrepreneur education happens organically um, through the community, through TechCrunch, through you know other online communities. So it's really more of the ecosystem of the investor side that is the challenge. Uh, as that develops, I think we could probably get to 50 to 100 metros or geographies around the world, maybe, maybe more if we're lucky. Do you think there should be an accelerator for investors? Uh, yeah, and that's actually something that we're kind of working on. Um, I mean, I, I won't say that we're in that business today as much, um, but you know, probably a future vision for us is probably not 500 startups, it's more like 500 VCs. Um, so you know, having a lot of independent investors that run their own investment thesis and that we help you know, figure out how to get either funds started, work with Angelus, work with the investor community. Um, is, that how, is that how Durian's works? Literally. Kind yeah, of it is kind of a little bit how Durian's and how Edith's funds also work. So uh, there's sort of like an 80-20 sort of setup for that where they you know, operate under our brand and use some of our back office, but they're basically keeping 80% of the carry of fees and they're investing on their own thesis. Um, the, one difference is that we co-invest together in a lot of those opportunities, so the main fund benefits from their uh, individual thesis and their exposure to their region or domain area of investing. Okay. Um, so you've done a lot of travel around Asia. Um, so we wanted to, the last time I saw Dave was in Tokyo, at the start of Asia Tokyo. I was on stage talking um, with some other people from the Valley. Um, so you've been everywhere. What, what's your like outside I of Beijing? Everywhere. I've been, outside been of Beijing, to about forty-two countries. That's true. <laughs> outside of Beijing, and of course, there are a lot of travels with, with Kylie. Um, just let's just talk about what do you see out here? 
Um, so I guess I've talked a little bit about China, and I would say, again, long-term bullish, short-term a little cautious, um, but that's a huge market that we're going to spend a lot of time on over the next decade or more. Um, I would say the East Asian markets are interesting, and we've had a you know, reasonable amount of experience in Japan and Korea. Uh, we've done about 15 investments in Japan. We've done about five or six in Korea. Why? Why? What's, it, what's it uh, Well, some of it's personal connection. I, my wife's Japanese, and some of our investors are from Japan. And we just started somewhat randomly because uh, of Satellite in Japan. Um, and Japan's a bit of a conundrum because it's, uh, you know, relatively speaking, probably one of the most interesting places to do um, uh, startups or do internet entrepreneurship. The market up size relative to entrepreneur competition is probably the biggest uh, in the world, I would say, at least roughly speaking. Like, it's the most developed consumer market in terms of devices, spend, online adoption, and it's the least developed in a lot of ways in terms of the entrepreneurial community there and their approach to risk taking. And not very many other people come to Japan. Uh, there are some Chinese and Korean entrepreneurs who are have, have historically gone after the gaming market in Japan, but um, a lot of other areas outside gaming that most non-Japanese don't really access, including the US. Uh, and you have a few exceptions to that, like Evernote and some other things, but uh, gameplay. Um, but yeah, I think that if we were able to sort of crack the nut on getting more Japanese entrepreneurs or more entrepreneurs just generally to go after Japan, we would probably be a hell of a lot more active uh, just because the market opportunity is so tremendous there. Uh, whereas if you contrast like China is like a very big market, but everybody's going after it, the Chinese and everybody else. And so it's a very competitive environment. And right now it's a kind of overpriced in some ways. Um, Korea, you know, we haven't had as much experience there, but we're probably going to start doing a lot more. Uh, one of the folks on our team is Korean American is working on uh, a project over there. Um, there's a lot of enthusiasm from Korean business and Korean government. Uh, sometimes that's misplaced. They're actually doing a pretty substantial matching program for VCs in Korea right now. That's, I think, eight to one or nine to one leverage. That a little bit scares me. Um, there are a lot of talented entrepreneurs in Korea, but they're not, like, like Japan, they're not super well equipped to do business outside uh, their own market. Um, although we've found a few that we've uh, backed. Um, so I think there's, Korea's an interesting market in itself, similar to Japan, you know, high bandwidth, lots of spend, relatively dense population, uh, but um, still a lot more to learn. And I think sometimes, there's so much enthusiasm, and there's obviously entrenched folks from Korea, like Samsung and others, who are, you know, I think feeling under pressure. I think Samsung, to some extent, has made tremendous strides over the last five, 10 years, uh, and has taken a big chunk of the market, but they're probably feeling a little bit under pressure from companies like Google and Facebook and Amazon that have tons of software talent, um, and so they've had to acquire a lot of the software talent. They have lots of hardware uh, and engineering and consumer talent. Um, you know, broader set of topics, we're very bullish on Southeast Asia and have started to do a lot there. Uh, we have folks on the team now who are in uh, Malaysia, in, uh, in KL, in Singapore, in Jakarta. Uh, we're doing a lot of investments in Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, and probably starting in the Philippines and Vietnam. Um, probably about 25, maybe 30 investments across the region. Um, I think, uh, you know, Thailand's Really quite interesting, very creative uh, market. Um, you know, pretty decent size. So Indonesia is like huge, but a lot of other challenges going on there. So we're spending a lot of time there, but still more to develop. Um, and then India has recently uh, sort of including a lot of greater Asia. I don't know if you guys think of Asia as including all these countries. <laughs> Um, India, we've done about 15, actually so probably 20 investments over the last two or three years. Uh, we have a partner on the team who was in India but is now in New York and goes back and forth. Um, and India's been a pretty negative sentiment market for the last two years. Well, not for us, we actually thought it was pretty positive, but a lot of the rest of the local Indian market sentiment was pretty negative. Uh, that changed about six months ago with the Modi election. And um, now there's a ton of positive energy. It was just over there about three months ago. Uh, 
And, and everybody's like all of a sudden really excited again. Now we, we, we kind of were like, what changed in your minds in the last three years? Like we thought it was always pretty amazing. Uh, but I think just the amount of smartphone penetration now, I think India's added over 100 million users on smartphones in the last year. They'll probably add another 100 million this year. Um, there's still tons of challenges in India. Uh, and I, there's not a time to really go over all of those challenges, how fucking challenging India is right now. But uh, long term, you know, it's the biggest market on Earth. Uh, it will eclipse China, at least until Nigeria or Africa does. Um, and uh, if they only get out of their own way, it's gonna be really interesting. So sorry, I was trying to cover like half the planet there in the last <laughs> seven or eight minutes. Very uh, good, very good. All right, uh, now let's get into some like, uh, maybe more practical information about, you know, people coming to pitch you, pitches you've seen. Um, don't pitch me. Okay, yeah, exactly. don't pitch you at all. But um, any any tips and tricks that you've seen lately that you'd like to share with people? Um, I I, have, I always struggle with this one because we want to we want to meet new entrepreneurs, but it's just really hard in you know thirty seconds to get a handle on what people are all about. Um, and sometimes your story isn't what I want to care about. A lot of times I really want to look at the product and the customer metrics. Uh, for us, I think you know we're going to want to hear backwards looking story, not forward looking story. And other investors may parse that differently, but when I hear you talking about what you're going to do and everything in the future, I kind of think you're a lying bullshit artist and I don't really care. Uh, and when you tell me what you have done in the past, then if I don't think you're lying, I'm actually a lot more interested in what has actually happened with your business over the last you know, two, three quarters, or maybe two, three years. Um, so you'll you'll hear me say I'm much more interested when you're speaking in the past tense or the present tense, not the future tense. The more you speak in the future tense, the more I just tune up and don't give a fuck because you're just basically guessing. Um, and so I used to say you know you know tell me about the problem and I might empathize with the problem and understand the customer. I used to say pitch the problem, not the solution. Now what I say is pitch me the metrics, and uh, if you don't have any metrics, then pitch me the problem. Um, and I do want to hear kind of what you're doing and what everything's all about, but there's a lot of we're going to do and a lot of we're going to grow and we're going to start monetizing and we're going to launch. I sympathize with the entrepreneurial condition and being stuck in the future. Um, I'm, I'm stuck there myself. Um, but I kind of want to assess talent based on what you've done already. Um, anyway, there's more stuff to talk about pitching. If you want to sure. see my stuff online, you're welcome to. But Pitch traction first, if you have traction. If you don't have traction, pitch the problem. Uh, if you start off telling me the solution, I will probably tune out. Okay, great. How about valuations? I wish we talk about China and how they're out of control. Are they still in control in the valley? And when you look at the rest of Asia? Uh, no, I mean, the valley has that issue on a smaller scale too. And, um, there's certainly been a lot of success stories in the last couple of years that are driving the valuations higher, so, you know, I think in the Chinese market, you have Alibaba and Xiaomi, and the US market, you have Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and Uber and others. And I'm not just pitching about Uber because I didn't invest at the $10 million valuation, although that was my mistake. Um, fuck me, Travis. I'm so sorry. Please, please forgive me. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the market is pricing every company as, as if it's the best in the category. And sometimes that's not irrational, but a lot of times on the average case, that is irrational. Um, so, but there's been some interesting things that are happening in the U.S. market that I think is what's uh, driving that, whether they're correct or not. You have late stage uh, investing, and by late stage investing, I'm talking about sort of Series C, D, and IPO equivalent financing, so 50 to $500 million financing and up that are used to happen in the public markets and are now being displaced by private actors. Um, and those could be a combination of venture funds that have grown bigger, uh, like you know, say Andreessen, Sequoia, Excel, Greylock, those guys. Uh, it could be private equity funds coming down into the market and doing a different kind of business than they have been historically. Uh, it's corporate investors deciding to get into those businesses. Uh, some of that's international corporate coming to the U.S. So you see a lot of Chinese investors now, uh, Tencent, Alibaba, Baidu, you know, investing in sort of late-stage market um, opportunities from you know large U.S. companies. 
Um, and um, I'm sorry if I'm missing another category, but in general, like the stage of IPO has been pushed out probably one order of magnitude, maybe even two in the US, and probably at least two years, maybe three years. So companies like Facebook and Twitter and Uber don't have to go public to raise billions of dollars. They can do that from private investors. Uh, DST and other uh, investors are discovering that there's plenty of growth in the market after the companies are already half a billion to several billion dollars in valuation. And those companies are not getting to the retail market, at least in the US, as much as it's worth that they have. Um, and as long as those companies don't fuck up, you would have to agree that that is a, uh, that is a logical strategy. If those companies are growing that dramatically, uh, historically, after they came to market, they're still continuing to grow quite considerably. It does make sense that private actors would take that business away from the public markets and try and own it. Um, and so I think that that is a substantial long-term systemic change that we are seeing. Uh, it doesn't mean the prices are, are logical. They may misprice that, and some of that market may then come back into the IPO market. Um, and I think we will probably see that in China, based on what I think is going on. Uh, it might be that Xiaomi and Alibaba are worth that much. I'm not sure every other Chinese company is similarly valuable. Um, so it sort of depends on where the market prices the second place companies and certainly the third place through the rest of the market. You know, is it according to those companies the same types of evaluation multiples in the private market uh, or the public market after it goes uh, out? So I, I think a lot of that, at least at the moment, we're seeing a very happy climate. Uh, and I would hope that that's driven by internet entrepreneurs getting better at their craft and getting better at winning more frequently and winning big more frequently. Uh, if that's not the case, and then we encounter some early 2001 or other types of events, whether in China or other places, you'll see a similar pullback in the market. Uh, as the late stage stuff gets priced up, the rest of the market further down also gets priced up, uh, particularly if people in the earlier stages can get liquidity in these late stage financings. Uh, you're gonna see you know, valuations on the low end get happy as well. Um, and then as lots of consumer and retail angel investors jump into the market because they see the Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter story, or because they see Alibaba, Tencent story, uh, angel investors who are less price sensitive also jump in. And although I don't think they're gonna displace the VC community at the Series B level, they might displace the VC community at the seed and Series A level to a limited extent. And that's already resulting in sort of crazy prices in at least Silicon Valley and occasionally New York, uh, and maybe other geographies around the world sometimes. Sorry for getting a long answer about all that. Okay. Um, we're not gonna go to the questions yet, but just take a look. If you're not on the patient hall, there's some questions here. You can ask Dave, just hold them up. Hold them up, but we're gonna keep going. We have just a couple more slides here for you, Dave. Okay. Um, accelerators. Um, so, you Way know, too many of them, they don't work. It's complete fucking sham. That's that, exactly, that's what I was gonna do. That's what I was gonna do with that. So, Hong Kong, we don't have any. And there's a couple of new ones starting up, hopefully this year. Um, but, and India has one like in every corner, seems like. So what do you think about that outside? I mean, you guys kind of started, the, you guys, tech stars, um, you know, guys I would say Bill Gross started the yep. modern accelerator in the late 90s, and then Y Combinator was probably the modern version of that. Tech stars seemed after them, but we came out five years later, so we were kind of later to that game. Um, I think there's certainly a useful place in the universe for, for accelerators, uh, at least if they are investing money, there is, uh, for the folks who are just providing garage space and taking equity and not putting money in, I think that's sketchy shit. Uh, for the people who are investing money, I just think it's, it's very difficult to run a sustainable accelerator program or one that makes a profit, um, whether that's on the equity side or on something else that they do. Um, our, our model is a little bit unique in that we invest $100,000 out of our fund and then we take $25,000 back as a program tuition fee uh, kind of like a college tuition almost, and the 25,000 kind of covers our operating costs. So we're sustainable based on that model, and then we hope to make money on the investment uh, over the long term, but that time frame on investment probably is not less than 
three to five years and probably more like five to seven years, really. Um, so I think just inherently most people who are running accelerators are not clear on the economics, don't understand how to make that work, either in the short term or in the long term. They're probably running on one-time dollars from either sponsorships or grants or their own pocket, and that's probably not going to last more than two or three years. Um, and even if they were sustainable on long-term sponsorships or grants or something else, most of them aren't going to make money on the investments, and that takes you know three, five, seven years to see. So it's challenging on both the short-term operational structure, it's challenging on the long-term investment return structure. Um, and I know this from our own experience. <laughs> Um, so we've been running the accelerator programs in U.S. and Mexico now for a little over three years. Uh, Eleven cohorts in the U.S., a little over 300 companies in Mexico. I think uh, five cohorts, about 75 companies. Um, by the second year and the fifth or sixth cohort, we sort of dialed it in. We thought, okay, we're starting to make money on this. The investments look like they're working, at least in the aggregate. Um, but we were also operating at a scale that most people don't do. We were doing 30 companies a batch, and they, except for YC, nobody else is doing anything close to that. Um, so I think without the proper scale, without the proper deal flow, without the right set of mentors, without the right set of downstream investors, it's very, very difficult to run these programs sustainably and profitably. Um, that said, there's probably going to be a lot of accelerators. Most of them will fail. A few of them will be good. Uh, a few of them will work, and there's always going to be great and talented people, um, you know, in the entrepreneur side and on the accelerator side, who will be successful regardless of the market conditions. Um, I think what we are more likely to see over the next couple of years is specialization, and you'll see accelerators coming out that are not, you know, broad across all areas. They'll do fintech, they'll do video, they'll do gaming, they'll do SaaS, they'll do commerce, um, and I think that's much more likely to be. A successful model, in my opinion, um, doesn't mean that they're going to make money, but at least they'll have differentiated strategies. Um, in the higher, you know, overall sense of it, I'm much more negative on business schools than I am on accelerators. So there's uh, probably just as much bullshit going on in the MBA programs as there are <laughs> in accelerators, and they charge you a hundred thousand. So instead of Instead of you pay the MBA program $100,000 for a worthless fucking piece of paper, let us give you $100,000 and then fail. And at least you'll learn something. And maybe the second time you won't fuck that up. Uh, but uh, you know, accelerators like startups, there's going to be a lot of failure. And over the next five to 10 years, hopefully a, a small percentage of them will be sustainable and might even be useful. Great. OK. Um, we, last year, around this time, we did a conference on crowdfunding. And we found out a lot of the successful Kickstarter campaigns actually came from Hong Kong, obviously because of our proximity to China. Really? But yeah. One of the top I thought a lot of money might come from Hong Kong. I'm not sure what that's successful. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, like um, Three Dooler was one of the bigger ones. They make a few million dollars. So they're doing pretty good. Uh, yeah, there's been some failures on it as well. But what is your take on crowdfunding now going forward? Is it, and not just for Kickstarter projects, but in, in, in the long term of this kind of uh, funding? <laughs> Uh, I'm a big believer in the general concept. I wish we had invested in Kickstarter early. Uh, early. Uh, we're investors in AngelList and we're investors in, uh, uh, sorry, WeFunder, I think, out of Mexico. Um, the area there, we're probably, depending on how you define uh, crowdfunding, we're probably investors in another three or four or five different uh, areas. And I would say, just like accelerators, I expect specialization to happen in a bunch of different areas in crowdfunding. Uh, within crowdfunding, we should be more definitive about whether we're talking about uh, donations, customer pre-purchase, or actual equity purchase, uh, which actually is less frequent. Most of what I just described, uh, exception of Angelist, was you know, pre-purchase or customer donations. Um, uh, that said, I think we're gonna see a lot of innovation on that. I think we're gonna see a lot of activity happen on that. Um, I don't know that you'll see a lot of crowdfunding campaigns above $100,000 in the aggregates. Uh, my thought is for the first fifty dollars to $500,000, it's quite helpful, and maybe beyond that for some companies, uh, it's less common. Uh, we have one company in our portfolio that raised half a million dollars in their first Kickstarter campaign, another seven fifty dollars on their second campaign. That's unusual to see people go to the well twice and be successful with that. Um, 
but uh, it can certainly displace a good bit of the seed stage and angel investor market. And if you can, you know, it's non-dilutive capital if it's customer pre-purchase or donation. Um, so particularly, particularly for hardware-based companies or other companies where there's substantial uh, capital expenditure um, in the first year or so, it can be a great way to get off the ground. Um, I still think there's a lot of risk in taking the money in and then not being able to deliver the product or not being able to deliver the product in time, not being able to deliver the product profitably. Um, so just because you raise successful Kickstarter campaigns doesn't mean you've done anything other than like take on a half million loan or debt. Yeah. Um, uh, but you know, it is here to stay and it's gonna be very helpful for a lot of companies. Uh, and again, where I was talking about, there's lots of markets where the first quarter million to $2 million is not easy to raise. And if it's helpful in getting that off the ground, that's quite useful. Uh, it's also good in that it proxies for marketing sometimes. And a lot of the biggest failures of entrepreneurs that we run into is where they're good at building product that's shitty at doing customer development and marketing. So, you know, successful Kickstarter campaigns, you know, if they're not lying about what they can do and if they actually deliver the product are good filters for the customer acquisition and marketing side of the equation. Do you think investors look more favorably on successful Kickstarter campaigns? Or uh, we certainly do. Okay. We would, again, I would see that as evidence of you having your shit together on the marketing customer acquisition side. Uh, cautiously want to also see you deliver that product though, because if you're just good on the marketing customer acquisition side and you can't deliver the product, then you're just a thief. <laughs> okay, let's just give you um, growth hacking. One thing that uh, it's on everybody's mind, well, everybody's talking about it last year, and it'll probably be a lot about this year, and I, I watched some great talks from you about it. Growth, growth hacking is the new losing your virginity. Uh, everybody's talking about it, less people do it than actually talk about it. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the term, actually, we should be more customer acquisition consulting, but that doesn't sound as sexy. So growth hacking is the term that has caught on. Uh, and at least five people in our company have that title now, so I guess we have bought into it too. Uh, I think this is probably the most important thing for entrepreneurs to focus on at the moment. Um, more than learning how to code, more than learning about lean startup, more than learning about pitching. The most important thing that you can do is figure out how to scalably and profitably, profitably may not be the case, uh, grow your customer base via multiple online marketing channels. Uh, typically search, social, and mobile. Uh, that probably means in the non-Chinese markets, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Apple, and Android. Uh, and you could throw in Pinterest and YouTube there, and maybe email and affiliate and a few other places. So uh, great book or online PDF uh, is a book called Go Traction, or Traction Book. I'm not sure if I remember the title correctly. Uh, it's a yellow cover, about 150 page PDF. Uh, it's about 20 different case studies of different growth channels. I think it's free, uh, or certainly five or 10 bucks. Uh, one of our company founders uh, and one of our employees uh, contributed to that. Um, you know, the, the big change on the planet is not technology, as much as that's the story that's reported. Technology's been going on for a long time. Uh, the really, really big change is that Five to 10 years ago, most of the planet was not accessible via online customer acquisition techniques and online marketing, and now they are. So in the pace of you know, maybe the last five years and the next five years, five to seven billion people who are not accessible are going to be accessible. So learning how to code is important and a necessary competency, but not the most important thing in a successful startup. And I say that as an engineer who you know, was coding from age of 10 or 11, uh, not the most important thing. Um, we spend a lot of time learning how to code. We go to schools for that. There's lots of education around that. Design, now also a very well understood discipline. Online marketing, not a very well understood discipline, not very many schools for it. Most of the platforms that are the places where you acquire customers are less than five years old. Uh, there's just not very many experienced people who know how to do uh, mobile app distribution for Android, right? Um, that's still pretty recent and nascent 
skill set, and the people who are really good at it don't want to tell anybody else because they want to preserve their advantage, and they're probably working for their own private startup company. <laughs> um, but these are the things that we need to understand, uh, and it's a huge opportunity. Um, you know, the, the ability to reach billions of customers on the planet uh, by just having one or two people focus on online marketing campaigns. Incredible leverage. Uh, so I think, you know, yes, teach your little girls how to code. That's really important. But teach them human psychology and internet marketing just as importantly, possibly more importantly, because that's going to be the differentiated skill set. Uh, and I'll leave it there. Don't you have an internal conference about this? Yeah, we uh, affectionately named a conference WFD right in the middle of the Israeli-Gaza uh, <laughs> conflict. Perhaps not our best marketing moment, or maybe our best marketing moment. Uh, weapons of Mass Distribution was our affectionate name <laughs> for an internet marketing conference. Uh, and was, you know, probably one of our most successful conferences. We had a lot of really amazing people from you know, Pinterest and Airbnb and all sorts of uh, folks just talking about case studies. Pretty, again, I was surprised at the level of transparency and some things that people probably didn't need to tell the rest of the market about. They expected, uh, it's, they think that you expect them to be that transparent, so uh, make it good. We got just really amazing folks to talk about stuff that they probably shouldn't talk about. <laughs> so I don't know if Brian knows that that talk was going on. <laughs> uh, but Chesky from Airbnb. Uh, yeah, so I, I think, uh, and by the way, that's online if you guys want to check out the talks. Uh, WMD.co is the website, and I think most of our uh, speakers are on YouTube, uh, and most of the presentations as well. Um, so yeah, we're, we're trying to do that a lot more frequently. We might actually take that conference and do it internationally. Uh, yeah. We'll certainly keep doing it at least on an annual basis. Uh, We'd love to have that here, Dave. Yeah. yeah. And it's different for the Chinese market. There's yeah. lots of different topics that will be local to the market. Okay, the last one quickly before we go to questions. Uh, tech trends. So 2015, Apple Watch is coming out. Drones are going around. Time. Seriously? What, what, are you, what are you looking at? What do you see? What are you hearing a lot of pitches? Are you hearing a lot of a watch <laughs> app? Design? So uh, I am the wrong person to ask about what's hot because we actually do not give a fuck about that shit. Uh, <laughs> what, do, what do other people think are hot? Uh, messaging apps, photo apps, what? video apps, drones, uh, internet of things, whatever the fuck that is, wearables. <laughs> what else am I missing? All right, okay, never mind. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll just go to the, we'll just go to the question. So, wait, wait, wait. Okay, more? I will say that there's a couple of things that we do care about. Uh, uh, video commerce, although that sounds very basic, uh, just the combination of video and selling stuff. Uh, video increases conversion, and you don't have to monetize video via advertising and sponsorships, just go direct to customer via the internet. It's a really basic observation. Um, you know, and eventually you won't say video commerce, it'll just be commerce, and every commerce will include video. Uh, but that's a formula we'll be going after. Um, SaaS on an international basis, so that's SaaS has been a really big topic in domestic US and Europe, and I think that's going to progress internationally. Uh, mobile is getting easier to monetize. Uh, so even though there's a lot of people whining and moaning about mobile being harder now than in the past, I kind of think they're full of shit, but they are correct that mobile monetization has been challenging. That's going to get easier. Is that why you have a new fund specifically for mobile? That's Edith's thesis, and I would say that you know, people were asking us why you're launching a mobile fund in 2015, exactly. you're a little late. <laughs> we were like, well, maybe, but actually all the people who are doing mobile investing over the last five years haven't made any money. Uh, or at least the companies they're investing in are challenging. So we, we think there's a lot better monetization for mobile models. Uh, strangely, one of the things we're not doing as much of out of that fund is we're probably not investing in mobile gaming, which is where a lot of the dollars for mobile have gone historically. Um, you know, other broad stuff we're interested in with, you know, it's very transactional basic models, but most, most of our investment thesis is finding really dumb, unsexy, brain-dead fucking business models that happen to be moving online. Uh, an example of this is a company we invested in out of Egypt that's doing online funeral uh, notices. How sexy is that? <laughs> uh, but Depends on your a, preference. What? Depends on your preference. <laughs> you know, people spend a lot of money on funeral notices and, you know, 
Last time I checked, everybody's a customer, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Okay, thanks a lot, Dave. So we're gonna go to the questions. So thanks for everybody for using and voted up some of the questions. We'll start with number, the most uh, voted question is obviously a very Hong Kong specific question. Uh, from Maggie Lau, what is the biggest area of improvement for Hong Kong as a startup hub? I'm not sure if that question is historical or future. Um, I think it's, it's what is the biggest area of improvement for Hong Kong that they should do. Yeah, and that's, that's look that. You've been here a handful of times in the last couple and, of years. Yeah, I'm not so expert that I would advise. Um, I would say probably figure out how to import talent from China uh, that has a reason to come to Hong Kong and then fund it. Uh, the problem with that statement is right now there's way too much money in Beijing and you're going to have a tough time recruiting those folks. So you probably can't attract them with capital, you probably have to attract them with other things. So, you know, without getting into trouble with the Chinese government, I'm sure there are creative ways that you can think about that statement. Maggie, are you here? Okay, does that answer your question? Um, okay, Maggie? Uh, I, I would say, you know, frequent check writers tend to attract startups. It's just, for Hong Kong, I would say, uh, we were just discussing this morning. Uh, FinTech, retail tech, and shipment, uh, shipping and logistics are probably three areas that Hong Kong has a natural affinity for, and so I would try and build the brand around those kind of areas, and probably the luxury customer. Maggie, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right, the next one is, uh, what from, this is from, uh, oh, names is a, oh, don't, don't have 37 co-working spaces in Hong Kong doing the same fucking thing. <laughs> <laughs> and one of them, or two of them focus on FinTech, one of them focus on retail tech, one of them focus on logistics tech, find people who are investing, find, find companies who are actually building products, and then get small checks for it. Uh, from Nishant, uh, what's the typical deal structure of a 500 startups investment? Uh, so for our accelerator in the US, it's 100K for 7%. If you're doing uh, half a million to a million in revenue or you raise half a million to a million in financing, we might negotiate on that. If you haven't, then we won't. Uh, again, so we give you $100,000, uh, we take back $25,000 as a program fee, you get net 75K. It's a four month uh, program. It's resident in the US in Mountain View or San Francisco. Uh, we focus on business model, design UX, uh, growth hacking, scalable customer acquisition, pitch prep, get you in front of several hundred investors, hopefully help you raise half a million to a million dollars or more, uh, which usually happens about 20 to 30% of our companies raise a million or more, about 50 to 70% raise a half million, a third fail. Uh, maybe not quite that much. Um, in Mexico, those numbers are slightly different. It's 50K, uh, less 15K for 10%. Um, for our seed deals, it's usually 50 to 100,000 for, depends on valuation, but uh, in the US market, between four to seven million valuation. So, probably one to two percent, maybe up to three percent. In international markets, it's probably between one to five million dollar valuations, so maybe two to four percent. All right, Nishan, we'll see how good those, those numbers are. From Shopline, will come up later and tell you if it was a good deal or not for them. That rate, so <laughs> All right, next question. What is your own biggest startup failure? Not investing in Uber, fuck me. <laughs> $10 million value check. I can pull this email up. Do you want me to pull this email up? <laughs> you still have the and email. So I was looking at it. The, the, here's the fucked up thing was like somebody misreported that we were an investor in Uber in the latest round on Crunchbase, and I got uh, a, uh, what do they call it? A summons for somebody trying to sue, sue Uber, Uber, and I got a summons. I'm like, I'm not even an investor, and because they're suing me. Like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> Hold on, let me see if I can find it. Like, seriously. I That's pretty it. strong if even our non-investors get sued. I was like, what the fuck, Travis? Come on. Sorry, it's called Uber Taxi at the time. What do you Uber think of that? Uber what do you think of that, actually? Yeah. That's a good thing to talk about, even though Sam's in the room. But, uh, you know, what's all, what is, you know, that's gonna hurt them, all this, uh, all this media attention? <coughs> if you're, if investors- Travis Planet, June 10th, 2010. Dave, over the first last year or so, Garrett Camp and I have been creating a company called UberCab. It's an on-demand car service application with iPhone apps for passengers and black car fleets. Blah, 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 blah. Wow. I don't know Uber CEO and I would. Right, great. Right. So one of the reasons I didn't invest was Travis wasn't the CEO at the time. And I thought Travis and Garrett were fucking rich playboys, which was true. <laughs> but I was still fucking wrong. Uh, Ryan Gray's Uber CEO and I would like to do something like that. Anyway, so, yeah. 
So I hadn't finished raising the fund. Part of it was I didn't really have money at the time, although I still should have done it out of my own pocket. But major fuck. <laughs> yes. So what do you think, uh, just on the side note of that, because there's a lot of media attention on Uber today, negative attention. Do you think that the investors, anybody taking account, or is that just sour grapes from the sour taxation? grapes? Okay. Sour grapes, and they're an easy target. They're, you know, very, very impressive company, growing incredibly. And they might not be successful in China, and they might have legal challenges in other places. Travis is probably the best fucking entrepreneur I know. He knows a lot of son of a bitch at times. Uh, and that was a clear mistake. And not was it just a mistake the first time, like I should have done it in the next three rounds. <laughs> uh, I was, another story. The real reason that I'm so frustrated about this was I was looking for this investment. I was, I was looking at different cap related internet companies. <laughs> And I had been an investor in uh, Zimride, which became Lyft, when I was running the Facebook fund. So probably one of my best investments is Lyft. I invested a $3 million valuation, and they're over a billion. Uh, but then Lyft came to me later, and they're like, hey, we figured this shit out. We're going to go after it. And I was like, fuck you. Uber's going to kill you. So I didn't invest in that one either. I had 500 startups. So I, an investment category that I was looking for, I missed two of the big com biggest companies on the fucking planet, and they asked me to. I am just an idiot. <laughs> anyway, very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, Uber's got some challenges, but they're mostly PR marketing challenges. Uh, it's a great company. They're going to be very big and very successful. They're already very big and successful. Uh, what is the 500 startups definition of a successful startup? Scalable, profitable customer acquisition on a repeatable basis. Okay. Great. Let's go back to number five, the top one. What type of startup would you do now if you were to be an entrepreneur again? I am doing a startup. It's called 500 Startups. <laughs> <laughs> it's going very well. <laughs> Any of you guys accredited investors want to invest in next month, please see me after this talk. Um, so, what startup would you um, Any, Anything, what, what's your hobby? Like, what, what, what would your personal interest? I don't have a lot of time for hobbies <laughs> anymore. <laughs> Uh, barely have time for my kids. Um, yeah, the video commerce one is one that I'm sort of fascinated with. I think that's interesting in a bunch of different categories. Um, the SaaS done for international markets is another one that I think is pretty interesting. Uh, English language education to non-English language speaking markets, even though that's a very competitive world, that's another one that um, I spend a lot of time on. Um, fitness apps are interesting. I just think that there's sometimes way too much attention going on to the hardware and not to the behavioral models. I, I'd love to see education and healthcare solved by different financial models, not necessarily the technology. And what I usually mean by that is doctors and educators should be paid on a derivative basis of the customers that they serve, not treatment symptomatic. Right now, doctors get paid for operating on people, which just drives them to, well, even advise you against healthy behaviors because doc cardiac cardiologists make more money if you have heart attacks and have heart operations. So people who advise their patients to not to, to have fitness activities don't make a lot of money as cardiologists. So, it should be done on more like an investment manager basis. So if, if, if doctors and educators got a percentage ownership stake in all of their students and patients, and then you debited them for treatment, education, or thing, that would be a more rational way to go. It's a very complicated model to set up, but it might be something to do in the future. Uh, we'll take one more question off of here. We'll go back to the thing. Oh, look at that. Uh, okay, uh, Mick Michael Michelini here came all the way in from San Jan this morning to ask, how about remote teams? How does the investor community treat teams spread out across the globe? Uh, in general, we're very negative on that. Um, in particular, well, I'm not necessarily, but let me explain. I would say that most people who are outsourcing dev talent, uh, whether or not it's successful for the company, is looked down upon by the investor community. Generally speaking, we'd like to see that the engineering talent is in the company. At the very least, that the senior engineering talent is in the company and managing the remote talent. 
Um, the best case scenario I see of that is you have a CTO or a VP of engineering that's in the company on staff and a remote team lead that's managing the remote team. Um, but that said, I mean, you can certainly do it successfully and Odesk and other companies have you know, built their businesses on providing the services remotely. Um, it's just historically been high risk for the companies and the talent leaves then you're at risk. Uh, but what I was saying before, I think actually the dev team is just one component of risk and the customer acquisition team is another component of that risk. So uh, we have seen companies build the products initially through remote outsourcing and then insource the tech staff once they get to a level of development. It's not that common, but it does happen. Uh, the main issue is really just managing the remote talent and that you have somebody on the ground managing that remote talent who is knowledgeable and gets you done, whether that person works for you or it's part of the outsource team. Okay, um, Ray, why don't you give Gene your thing and we'll set it up. Is that, well, before, while we change over to the next presentation, anybody have any questions verbally? Yeah. Is this, are these questions awesome? Verbally well, from we'll return to these questions later. As opposed to verbally, on, not from your mouth. On, on the successful... Um, Some of us talk to our ass. On, on the successful startup definition, I was I was more interested in kind of what level of performance or whatever are you are, are like you how do you qualify it? Well, no, like on the return side, because you said you had oh, like I a see. third that were successful and then for longer. us, um, so I think about that in two ways. One is what's going to get the company to the next level of financing or sustainability. So a right. million dollars in revenue, profitable, they could probably be sustainable for a small team of you know ten to twenty. Uh, a next round of financing for us is usually a million to three million dollars. And so the KPIs for the companies, depending on the business, that might be one to three million dollars in revenue, or it might be 10 to 30 percent monthly growth. Um, uh, uh, in the long run, I would say we will have a higher confidence of getting a return on the company if they get to 50 million dollars in enterprise value. That's a Series B post money equivalent. Right. Uh, below 50 million in value, they might be on paper profitable for us, but we might not see an exit. Um, that sounds a little weird, but that is yeah. that. it's actually easier to be successful as an entrepreneur than an investor. Remember, I was saying a third of our businesses thrive, and we might get an exit on half of them. So half of them will be successful for the entrepreneur on a cash flow basis, but not get to an exit for us. Um, that's not really always well understood by investors or entrepreneurs sometimes. Uh, and the meaningful ones for us, where we get larger returns, five to 10x, uh, and then you know, time bounded obviously, probably less than 10% of portfolio has a meaningful effort. I'm guessing five to 7% of portfolio from the numbers that we've seen historically. 80% uh, of our uh, returns have come from 10 exits so far. And 80% of those 10 exits came from three companies. So very fractal in nature. Right. Yes. Okay, uh, well, we're gonna, we're gonna stop it there. We'll come back later on, but let's give a round of applause to Dave. Thanks for your time. All right, next we're gonna bring up Ray, come up here and do a talk about uh, China. So I was very lucky a couple months ago, or we were lucky a couple months ago, we got invited to uh, Hawaii to do to their first startup conference to talk about Asia, because uh, Hawaii obviously is very small, small startup scene there. And so Ray did this great presentation on China, so I thought it'd be great for you all to see it as well, because uh, it basically scared the hell out of the Hawaiian startup people. <laughs> they, never seen it. they don't know anything about China, and then when you talk about it, China in this kind of in this way, you just can't believe it. So I thought this is a good way to kind of uh, get everybody into the mood here. So please welcome Ray Ma. How many of you are, uh, know a lot about the China internet ecosystem? I'll just speak really fast since we're like short on time. Okay, so let's take like 10 minutes, right? Uh, and you can find this presentation on SlideShare. It's a little bit actually outdated, even though it's from less than two months ago because China is really fast moving. So, um, like, uh, uh, like Casey said, um, China's the number one internet market, right? It's basically number one in a lot of key categories. Um, the main one that I look at is e-commerce, right? It exceeded e-commerce market in the U.S. last year already. So it's about 300 billion versus U.S. is only 260. And it's the largest mobile internet um, ecosystem. So if you talk to Edith, 
who is our new partner on the Mobile Collective Fund, um, she'll tell you that she's spending a lot of her time focused on Asia, and East Asia in particular, where um, actually her last job was at Dolphin, uh, came out of China anyway. Um, there are a couple of things about the China sort of ecosystem that makes it really interesting. It's probably, like, at least I think Dave agrees with me, it's probably second most active outside of the US. Um, there are a lot of, there are, sorry, uh, second most active globally, so first most active outside of the US. And um, a couple of new things have happened since um, last year, which is uh, there's been a bunch of local heroes, right? So that's really, these are the things that I think are needed for a sort of local uh, sort of ecosystem to thrive. So you need like local heroes, you need access to capital, you need exit opportunities. Um, and then finally you sort of need talent and then uh, supporting players, but really the first three is what you need. And in China you have all of those. So top 10 billionaires in China, five of them are made their net worth in tech, right? So I circle all of those, Alibaba, Baidu, Tencent, Xiaomi, and JD. Um, you have Alibaba, which has created, uh, which accounts for 86% of mobile e-commerce in China, so it's a titan. Um, <laughs> but also, um, it created, oops, right here, uh, expected to create, and I'm pretty sure the stat is well over uh, 10,000 now, 10,000 millionaires, and an average of 4.2 million. That was from I IPO price, so if you know, it's already sort of, uh, gone up by, I don't know, 80% or something like that from IPO price. So that number is probably a lot larger. Um, it's roughly double uh, the market cap of Amazon. Um, for later stage investing, China was 12% of global VC last year, so very large market. Um, and Silicon Valley funds have been there active there uh, well over a decade. Um, early stage investing is growing. There's some graphs you can see really fast, but so uh, there are, uh, if you look at the quick comparison on the bottom, um, I just took these stats off of like a uh, comparable to an angel list in China, and then I see something like 30,000 early stage startups listed versus 45,000 in the US, um, about 1,200 angel investor although that number is much greater in the US, but in terms of actually institutionalized seed funds, it's roughly the same at 200, um, something like that. Um, here are leading Chinese angels and seed funds. Um, you know, there's a lot of them, but a lot more than these actually, and, and a lot of newer funds are in the process of being committed um, a lot around $50 million. So uh, we will have a lot more co-investors in China shortly. Um, the exit environment is excellent. This isn't updated for the newest mobile IPO, which was uh, about two. I just looked at the company's about two billion dollars. So there were something like you know ten billion dollar ish IPOs um, or billion dollar market cap companies, new internet companies from China this year. And there's also been a significant amount of M&A activity um, by the Chinese large internet companies. So you can see a lot of these transactions are you know, well north of $100 million. Um, the talent is actually quite more expensive, I think, than most people realize. It's still cheaper than Hong Kong, I believe. But uh, I took this off of a, 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 re a very good recruiter friend. So the information is pretty proprietary. But maybe I'll just go through what we're looking at in China. So for us, we look at probably the top three uh, and less gaming. This presentation was created for investors interested in Asia Pacific region. So we look at a ton of cross-border opportunities. And then as Dave said, um, 2V or SaaS uh, opportunities. Um, and specifically because I'm based in China, I'm probably more focused than the other investment uh, partners on hardware related. So hardware, software, hybrid, this you know, am amorphous internet of things idea as well as uh, wearables. Um, so I've been making more trips to Shenzhen to figure out how we can participate in that. Uh, opportunity, but definitely one of the main things that we've done is cross-border. If you look at our accelerator companies, actually um, from Asia specifically, uh, at least from mainland China, the two accelerator companies that we've invested in are both cross-border, and as well as you know, uh, Shopify, you know, uh, Nine Guy can talk to you about their what they're pursuing, but generally also regional strategies. 
Um, and that's it. I don't want to take up any more time, and I want to leave it up to our alumni to talk about their, I guess, accelerator experiences. Great. Thanks, Ray. Everybody, Ray. Uh, thank you. Wow. That's crazy, man. Brilliant.